Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Brandt, President and CEO of AIM Employers Association, and welcome to This Week at Work. Welcome to the only show about the workplace that offers you front row seats and a microphone, bringing you practical, timely, and accurate insights so that you can more effectively lead your organization. It's Thursday, April 27th, episode 228. Today, we're hearing reports of employers being haunted by the upcoming changes to the I-9 form, which is set to expire on October 31st of this year. Now, the DHS will have it all dressed up in time for Halloween, but the big question is, how might it affect your hiring processes in the future? To help answer that question, we've invited Jennifer Roper, an attorney at Ogletree Deacons, to map out the road to I-9 compliance and avoid any unnecessary legal detours. And as always, we take your questions and your polls. Now, all this and more on This Week at Work. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bert is here alongside us once again. Welcome back, Bert. Happy to have you. And have you seen the news, Bert? Um, looks like this time next year, we will be having a rematch of our battle royal for presidency, Biden versus Trump. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think it's probably too early to say that, but uh, it does look like that to be the case, at least for now, that President Biden has made it official uh, with what some may call a tear-jerking video announcement that he is indeed going to be running for uh, four more years as president of the United States. Well, if nothing else, it'll be entertaining, and maybe Vegas will be taking odds on the handshake, whether they will or will not handshake before their debate. Uh, you know, I, I think that will be a, a odds uh, of a handshake or not. It's kind of like the uh, coin toss of the Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun with that at some point. I guess they'll have to be taking odds on whether there will be any debates or not. Well, that's true. That's true. I forgot about the, the threat Trump likes. Well, I won't debate. All right, so let's get on. That's not why everyone joined. We are really happy today. We got a wonderful guest joining us, Jen Roper from Ogletree Deacons, a good colleague of Birch. She's joining us today from Colorado. Good morning, Jen. How are you doing? Good morning. Doing really well. Thanks, Phil. Good, Jen. Can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am an immigration attorney based out of Tampa, Florida. I happen to be in Colorado this morning, but I represent companies and organizations of all sizes, basically helping with immigration compliance, I-9 questions, visa sponsorships, green cards, that sort of thing. Awesome. All right. So for our listeners, that's what Jen does. If you have questions around I-9s, that's going to be our focus today. We want to make sure that you're able to get people in the door and hire them correctly and be in compliance as easy as possible. And I know there's been some questions coming my way about the upcoming potential changes to the I-9 process. However, if you have other questions for Jen or Bert, submit them to the chat. We'll be happy to address them. We do have some poll questions today. Let's talk about, or let's introduce those real quick. Uh, first is, we'd like to hear from you and know, prior to this week's show, were you aware that the I-9 form is being revised in 2023? Simple yes or no will do. Uh, question number two, how do you rank the risk of I-9 form compliance against other compliance risk areas? So I'd like to get your opinion on that. And then one just for fun, are you looking forward to Biden versus Trump rematch? Uh, we'd like to just get some little fun going with that. As always, uh, we try to stay balanced. I'll try and keep Bert balanced anyway. We'll keep it like that. Uh, we all know his opinion, but that's because we represent employers. So we take the employer side on most uh, issues, but we try to bring some balance to the world as well. Bert, are you ready for Lawyer on the Clock? You got some good things to talk about today. As always, lots in the news, Phil. All right, let's kick it off. Lawyer on the Clock. All right, it's time to look into what's trending in employment law. Lawyer, you're, you're on, on the, the clock. clock. So the last few weeks, we've been talking quite a bit about uh, President Biden's nomination for the next Labor Secretary, Julie Sue. As everybody knows who's been listening to the program, Julie Su uh, comes to the federal government by way of the Republic of California, 
where she presided over California's effort to implement the ABC test on independent contractors. And there have been some developments on this. Again, she, previous, she previously served as Deputy Secretary of Labor under former Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, who I'll remind everybody left the Department of Labor to become the head of the National Hockey League Players Association. Uh, she has really emphasized her role in expanding what, uh, what apprenticeship and workforce programs. And uh, she has uh, quite, a, quite a record as labor secretary. A lot of Republicans and business groups regard her as uh, having been very, very uh, anti-employer. And so many of these groups have opposed Sue's nomination. Uh, last week, there were hearings conducted uh, the, on April 19, 2023, Subcommittee for the U.S. House Committee on Education Workforce uh, held a hearing titled Examining Biden's War on Independent Contractors, and uh, the hearing really focused on the Department of Labor's pending changes to the FLSA uh, in the independent contractor test, as well as Julie Sue's role in implementing California's AB, AB5, that's at uh, Assembly Bill 5, with the ABC test. So while all of that's been going on, uh, the she did sail through a committee vote. Uh, the, um, they, they advanced her nomination on party lines. Every Democrat on the com committee voted in favor of Julie Sue to become the next Secretary of Labor. But some of the Democratic colleagues have declined to publicly support her, in particular Democratic Senators Joe Manchin, John Tester and Mark Kelly and Senator Kristen Sinema, uh, an independent, have all declined to say whether they would vote for her in confirmation. The White House really has been working overtime to try to win those holdouts over. Uh, she's been meeting, Julie Sue has been meeting with several senators in recent days, but some top Democrats have even been acknowledged her nomination remains in doubt. So stay tuned because she, if she passes, if she makes it through, uh, confirmation, I think you are going to see the Department of Labor continuing to really pursue an aggressive agenda, especially around the area of independent contractor and staffing agencies, considering independent contractors and staffing agencies to be employees of companies versus independent. So stay tuned on that one. Needless to say, a little bit of a lightning rod, yeah? Just a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah, we, you know, the, the question becomes, uh, everybody has kind of seen what goes on out in California. And the question really is, do we want that uh, for, for the United States Department of Labor? And a lot of people are kind of up in arms about this. Well, I don't know if the people in California even like it, the way they're leaving the state. Now, if you look at the population growth, particularly of young people in the state of Nevada, right along the border there of California, I mean, they can't can't get out quick enough, but uh, who, who knows? All right. All right. What so else do you have there, Bert? Let, let's stick with California real quickly. I'll have to talk about this a little bit delicately, but there was some really big news out of California and uh, as it relates to Amazon and some delivery drivers in Amazon at Amazon uh, joining the Teamsters Union. Um, so uh, just this week, uh, the Teamsters Union announced that there was a group of 84 delivery drivers. The Teamsters characterized it as 84 drivers won the right to unionize, and I want to make it clear, it, it was not done by vote. This was done by voluntary recognition of the Amazon delivery partner, delivery service partner, uh, and a tentative agreement will be voted on by members of the that union in the next couple of weeks. So one delivery Robert, service what do partner. you mean? I'm sorry if I can cut you off when you say it was done by voluntary recognition. Uh, so that's that, not something that we see all the time. What, what's that mean? Yeah, and so that means that instead of having a vote on whether or not to unionize, the union collected enough union authorization uh, card signatures and then went to the employer, the delivery service partner, and said, we would want you to voluntarily recognize the union, and the delivery service partner agreed to do so. Okay, so, gotcha. So, the, the, so those... Uh, drivers for that delivery service partner, which by the way, is an independent contractor of Amazon. It's not Amazon itself, 
uh, but that delivery service partner is now unionized. And the Teamsters have been uh, kind of portraying this as a as a uh, as an election victory. It, again, it was not done by way of election. It was done by voluntary recognition, where that delivery service partner voluntarily recognized the union. Um, I think the significant piece from Amazon's perspective here is that uh, Amazon basically said that they were already having problems with this delivery service partner. Uh, the delivery service partner may have sort of been on the way out the door anyway, and before that delivery service partner got the boot from Amazon uh, and had their uh, contract with Amazon terminated, the delivery service partner gave uh, the union a gift and voluntarily recognized, uh, voluntarily recognized the union. So some politicking going on out there, but it makes for great headlines, but I want to kind of put it in perspective. Yeah, good. Well, more to come and keep us up to date on what you can, Bert. I understand. I will do so. I will do so. And one last one I want to cover really quickly. We've mentioned this before as we've continued to hear. I, I hesitate to even mention this because I don't want our, our AI uh, chatbot Monique to show up when I start talking about AI. But we have been talking about AI a lot on the program. Uh, everybody remembers our, our good friend, uh, Jen Betts, who is from Ogletree, who's been on to talk about AI in the workplace. Do you, do you have attor female attorneys that aren't named Jen? <laughs> we do, just a few, just a few. Okay. <laughs> We've had Lee Nason on here before. I mean, come on, Phil. You that's know right, that. that's right. So, I, we all love Lee. She does a great yep. job. All right. So, so uh, just in the last couple of weeks, the U.S. The, uh, EEOC, Again, the Department of Justice, I know we've been talking a lot about the Department of Justice, which is a scary proposition when we start talking about employment law and why the Department of Justice is getting involved. But the EEOC, the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission uh, released a statement and held a press conference just two days ago highlighting their commitment to enforcing existing civil rights and consumer protection laws as they apply to AI in the workplace. And I think the big focus here is, is that we know that some employers have started using AI and algorithms to help with decisions such as recruiting, interviewing, hiring, pay, and promotion. The government has stated that they recognize that AI has the potential to learn and even perpetuate unlawful bias, automate unlawful discrimination, and produce other harmful outcomes based on race, gender, disability, or other protected characteristics, according to the joint statement issued by those governmental agencies. And so these governmental agencies really are going to be out there looking for employment decisions that, uh, that, that have some sort of bias or discrimination built into them or learned by them in the space of artificial intelligence. And so employers who are using these tools really do need to be overseeing these tools to make sure that they do not end up becoming uh, discriminatory in their practices. Yeah, and you know, I think that's gonna be difficult for our HR leaders and business owners. I mean, they have really no idea if the AI is in some way creating a discriminatory practice. I, I, I would have no idea if a technology is doing that, that maybe we didn't design, even if we did design it and it, and it was generating a discriminatory practice, how would we, how would we even know, which would mean we're going to have to make sure we're doing everything that we can outside of that technology to show up on the right job boards, making ourselves available and you know, pursuing the effort of a, a balanced applicant pool. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, and, and what, what I think the point is, is that employers really need to have oversight of their artificial intelligence. And if they start seeing that their workforce, uh, the, 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 let's take applicants, for example, that uh, Blacks, Hispanics, females, uh, people over the age of 40 are being screened out by the artificial intelligence at higher than what would be normal rates, then they may have a problem with their artificial intelligence. And so 
uh, that's that's probably an easier example to see with applicants. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more challenging with respect uh, to pay decisions and other areas where people are using the artificial intelligence. But again, I think the key is, is that there has to be human oversight for the use of the artificial intelligence. Absolutely. Bert, while we have you on the clock, uh, before we get off, I want to just pull your attention to the chat. We have Kimberly, who um, is very complimentary of the program, longtime listener and first time caller. I always wanted to say that. I've heard that on the radio, never got to say that before. <laughs> uh, so thank you for all the nice comments there, Kimberly. But she's asking, and this is really maybe goes to you and or Jen, any word on any other states jumping on the bandwagon as it relates to uh, state paid leave? And I, th yeah. I think she's referring to the paid leave in Illinois. Yeah, the Illinois Paid Leave for Anything Act, uh, yeah. which makes <laughs> Illinois the third state uh, to basically have such a law. Uh, and, and yes, there there is a lot more word on other states jumping on this bandwagon uh, of paid leave. And I think that uh, if you look at the maps, Ogletree's got a great, I think it's a free state law map that shows uh, paid leaves across the U.S., uh, the various states out there. And I would say that this is definitely a trend. I don't want to get people too alarmed because most of these laws, paid leave laws, they already sort of, uh, they, they, they sort of assume that the employer already has a vacation or a paid time off policy. And they're not changing that much about what most employers are offering. Uh, so if you have a paid time off policy, a vacation policy, a sick time policy, you're largely going to be in compliance with most of these laws. You may have to balance out the buckets uh, that people can, you, you know, the buckets for reasons for people can take these leaves. But most of these laws are not impacting employers that greatly. It is, however, really impacting employers in the restaurant and retail sector because a lot of those companies do not have any forms of unpaid leave. Uh, you don't you 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 don't work. You don't get paid, and uh, so so that's just the 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 leave that exists. And uh, so so anyway, that's that's uh, what I'll have to say about that. That uh, basically start looking at the coasts, and you watch these laws move in toward the middle of the U.S. Uh, I don't think right now with the divided Congress that we're likely to see anything shape up on the federal level on paid leave right now. All right, very good. All right, uh, Julie just submitted a great question. We'll get to that here in a minute, Julie. Uh, let's uh, go ahead. And for the, the sake of time, uh, Nick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip Philbert's forum. Maybe we can get to that um, next week and I'll save you a little bit of work. Um, and let's get right to Jen and some conversation of I-9. Jen, again, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us this morning. I know it's a little earlier uh, there in the mountain time for us, but uh, let's kick off and maybe just tell us a little bit about what's happening in the world of I-9s and, and let's see where our conversation takes us. Sure, will do. And thanks again for having me this morning. So there's a lot of things to talk about in the I-9 world. A lot of chatter out there about the new I-9 form that is supposed to be released. We're thinking either late this year, possibly into early next year. They're talking about reducing it down. It's currently a two-page form, as you all have known and have probably struggled through what was supposed to be a very simple form that carries a whole lot of room for errors and penalties. But the government's talking about simplifying, and I'll, I'll put that in quotes, simplifying the I-9 process <laughs> to make it a one-page form. One of the other big pieces to this potentially revised form is that they may make the allowance for virtual I-9 inspection a permanent thing. So we may see that pop up as part of this new version of the form. But for right now, we are still dealing with that same old two-page version. It's the one that is set to expire in October of 2019. They have just made that extension indefinite. So when you're using the I-9 form, make sure that you're using the current version, which is that expiration of 10-21-19. And it's a wait and see to see what happens with this new form. So is there anything in particular about uh, the new form? So the government wants to change it to make it easier. What is proposed to make it easier for the employer? What would be the significant difference between current and proposed? Yeah, so one of the things they're talking about 
right now we've got this two page form where section one is what the employee fills out on page one and then the employer fills out section two and there's a lot of boxes on there there's a lot of questions and a lot of room for technical errors they're talking about streamlining all of this down so that it's on one page with a potential box that asks whether or not you've completed the process virtually the virtual inspection process is what they had put in place during covid that allows an employer to review an employee's i-9 documents either by scan or by Zoom. And that policy is currently set to expire in July. So they're talking about making that a permanent addition and building that into the new form, but it will come with some additional requirements. What's out there right now, and again, all of this is still proposed, none of this is final, is that if an employer is going to use this remote verification process, that there have to be some guardrails in place to make sure that the employer is reviewing the employee's documents and ensuring that all of the documents are legitimate. So they're talking about making E-Verify a mandatory piece of that process. In most states right now, it's voluntary. There are some states where it is required, and there are some federal triggers if you have a federal contract, et cetera, where you may have to be using E-Verify now. They're also talking about making the employers go through some additional training so that their recruiting and onboarding teams have the ability to spot fraudulent documents. One thing that a lot of companies don't know is that if you are using E-Verify, E-Verify does not ferret out fraudulent documents. E-Verify is a shared database between the Social Security Administration and Homeland Security, and it's going to determine whether or not information is false. It will verify someone's employment authorization, but it's up to you as the employer to be comfortable that the information that you're looking at belongs to the employee standing in front of you. So the balance on that is how do you do that in a virtual way to make sure that these documents haven't been tampered with, to make sure that it really is belonging to your employee. So it's a big balance and a big challenge. So in the, in the virtual world, then, are, is someone just actually holding up the document to the camera for them to see? And that that really is the risk because now you're really not able to, to touch it or examine right. examine it for any any potential art projects is what we call them. Be, yeah. yeah right <laughs> exactly where someone may be overlaying a photograph onto someone else's document or worse we've been seeing a pretty big trend recently where we have documents that are coming through that look pretty good and it there might be a driver's license typically it's a state id and a social security card that has information of a u.s citizen and it is passing e-verify because it's still legitimate data pool that belongs to a U.S. citizen out there it just doesn't happen to be your employee. So it's mm -hmm. identity theft is what's happening. So the government's trying to balance all of this, or how do you make a system that matches the current workforce with a lot of folks being fully remote, but still balancing against making sure that we're not allowing unauthorized workers to slip through the system? Yeah, um, it's, all, it's a funny story. I do tell it from time to time. So when I started here at AIM and we do background verification as part of our business, and um, of course they ran their background verification for me and are on me and, and come to find out, um, of course I had a perfect clear record, but we found that my social security was being used by uh, mm -hmm. someone else and his name was Jimmy Jimmy. First name, Jimmy, last name, Jimmy. Now, you would think that some employer somewhere would would look at this and go, Jimmy, Jimmy, like that. That's an unusual name that should be drawing some attention. And it was used all throughout the South. I mean, you know, five, six different locations in different states throughout the South. Um, and that I mean, really caused me a lot of headaches, to be honest with you. Um, I'd like to meet Jimmy, Jimmy. Uh, I just didn't know where he was working for sure to, you know, to go down and either meet Jimmy, Jimmy or the employer and go, you got to be kidding me. Did you I'll, not? I'm going right to, I'm going to date, I'm going to date myself. That sounds like a, a character from a Seinfeld episode, Jimmy, Jimmy. Yeah, it does <laughs> sound like that. You're right, Bert. I agree. Um, so Jen, if um, if we uh, talk about that, what are the requirements uh, today and would, do you expect them to be different on record retention? So the record retention, are, those rules are not changing, or at least there's no chatter out there about those changing. Right now, you must maintain a valid I-9 for all of your current workforce. And then, of course, making sure that you are retaining documents for the I-9s for anyone that is separated from your company. The rule on that is three years from the date of hire or one year from date of termination, whichever is later. 
that becomes a bit of a tricky math problem for a lot of folks. And so our advice to keep it simple is termination date plus three years, and you'll capture both ends of that equation. So none of that is changing. We want to make sure that you are retaining the documents appropriately. You can keep them in paper version. You can store them electronically. Either way is fine. But if you are maintaining an electronic version of your I-9s, the immigration agency wants to make sure that they are indexed appropriately to the point where you can pull one single I-9 if an agent shows up and asks for that information. And, Jen, and there's, Jen, if, can, I, can I just yeah. uh, jump in real quickly? Because one of the, the pieces of advice uh, that I've given to clients over the years for maintaining their I-9s is to keep a copy of the I-9 in the personnel file, but also have a separate uh, basically binder or folder, electronic folder of I-9 forms uh, that, that is separate and apart from the uh, actual personnel file. Can you shed a little light on why that's a best practice? Yeah, absolutely. You want to make sure for 100% that all of your I-9s are kept separate from the rest of your personnel files. And the reason for that is really a practical one. If the company undergoes an inspection, if an ICE agent shows up, and they're asking for your I-9 records, the very last thing you want to do is be opening those folders and possibly exposing that agent to some information that they really don't shouldn't have access to, whether it's wage and hour violations or you could have some you know, medical information, HIPAA concerns, all of that. You don't want the ICE agency having access to that. So keep them separate, either electronically in their own separate folders, or if you're doing a physical copy of the documents in a binder on a shelf somewhere separate and apart from the rest of your records. But it is okay to have a copy in the personnel file. Is that correct? It, it's okay, but I think we need to be very careful with training of the HR staff because we want to make sure that they understand that in the event of a visit from our friendly neighborhood ICE officers, that they're not going into those personnel records to produce that I-9 form. So we want to make sure that everybody understands that those I-9 records, whether they're in a binder on the shelf or whether they're in a, a separate electronic system, that's where you're going to look for that information. We're not even going close to those personnel files. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Bert, I always thought when you made a recommendation, that was best practice. And the answer was because Bert said so. But <laughs> uh, now we hear from Jen a whole lot more detail as to why it's a good practice. But uh, absolutely. So another question, Jen, is if, um, if someone's audited um, and they're found to have gotten it wrong, um, with uh, maybe they even done the, the um, e-verify. The, by doing e-verify, you still can be found to be wrong. And is the penalty lessened or more significant one way or the other, whether you've used e-verify or not? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we have done hundreds and hundreds of these I-9 audits over the years. And I have yet to see any company get it right 100%. Everybody does this wrong. There's a lot of human error involved in this. If you're using paper forms, there's a lot of room there for you to have technical violations, putting something in the wrong box, signing in the wrong place. And so a lot of companies are moving towards electronic versions of those, which eliminate some of those errors. But if you're doing an electronically generated I-9, the Immigration Service wants to make sure that you're maintaining an audit trail. And what I mean by that is the government wants to see that there's a login information showing your employee logged in for Section 1 and somebody else is logged in from the, from the employer side to fill out Section 2. So when you go through an audit, typically you're going to come out either with a warning if you're not doing too bad or with some sort of a civil penalty. The penalties right now are ranging anywhere from about $252 down to $2,507 per form. But the average that we see for employers that are making sort of the regular mistakes that you typically see in the seven to $900 fine range per form. So that can get pretty hefty if you've got a pretty large employee base. But there are a lot of things that a company can do to try to bring down those forms. The government recognizes that this is not an easy process and that everyone is likely to make a mistake somewhere along the line, but they're looking for companies that are showing a good faith effort to comply. So if you are doing a lot of things now before the government shows up, things like training your HR staff, doing internal voluntary audits, which we recommend that you do them once a year, and just showing and documenting all of the efforts that you're making to try to do this right. At the end of the day, all of that goes a pretty long way in trying to bring down those potential penalties in the face of a government audit. 
Uh, Jen, we, I know you've got to run right at the top of the hour to a client obligation. Uh, there is a great question in the chat here. Uh, Jean, Jean Elliott uh, is from a, from a company has said, asked the question, we hire short-term labor one to five days, generally from union halls. Who is responsible for the I-9s? So whoever is stepping in as the direct employer, so typically whoever is payrolling that individual is responsible for completing an I-9. If you have contractors that are not your direct employees, then it is the responsibility of that direct entity serving as the employer to fill out the I-9. Yeah, that's that's a that's a really good question. Great question. Jeannie. Um, and Julie had a question. I'll, I'll throw it out there. I think, Bert, it was in relationship to AI, but it was, what if uh, you do not have any idea of an age of an applicant? I mean, that's that's a common challenge for hiring managers. Sure. And I think that it, 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 that, that might be one that- I mean, I look for their high hiring. school diploma and I start yeah. doing math and then I start yeah. figuring out whether or not we want to hire the person because are they too old or young? I'm, well, we don't really do all those things, but uh, what do we do, Bert? Yeah. Well, I, I think we really do have to look at this, you know, including after the fact and looking to see if our uh, employee census data is shifting over time as a result of AI. If we see a shift uh, in that census data, then we know that there might be a problem. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um uh, Jen, we didn't even get a chance to get to our poll questions. I know you have to run. We're so thankful for you joining us today. Hopefully you'll come back and share some more knowledge with us. Keep Bert straight. We appreciate that. Um, we do have some good poll results. I will post those on my LinkedIn page. You can see the results there. Sorry that we ran out of time. Bert, you have a great day, Jen. Thanks again, Producer Nick. Thank we'll you. see you next week at 730 Central Time. Bye-bye. Thank you once again for tuning in to This Week at Work. If you enjoy the show, please share it with your colleagues. Forward our invites. Share the link aimea.org forward slash this week at work or follow or subscribe wherever you get your news and entertainment like LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We're everywhere you are. And you can be part of the show. Send your questions and comments anytime to info at thisweek.work. We'll see you next week, 7.30 a.m. Central Time, when we discuss what's happening this week at work.